So yesterday, through the generosity of a friend, I was able to bring my in-laws and my nephew and my friend and his son and even my own son to the ASU-UCLA football game. Now, being from California and a UCLA football fan, I was not happy with the outcome at all. (laughs) But if you think about a football game or a basketball game, when you think about a sporting event, all the, the action is really on the field, right? As a former football player in what seems like a lifetime ago, I'd much rather be on the field than in the stands, right? And I often think about that when I'm at sporting events. The fun in the stands pales in comparison to the fun on the field. From the stands, you watch what's happening, but on the field, you're making things happen, right? Now, now the same is true in a local church. There are those who are watching things happen, and there are those who are making things happen. Some are primarily consumers, while others are contributors. Some are spectators, others are supporters. Many are viewing what takes place here from the stands, but our text this morning wants you and wants me to be invested on the field, Now that's going to involve us talking about a very awkward subject, money. So if you're a Christian here today, you may have just said to yourself, I knew it. (laughs) All those churches talk about is money. That's all that they're about. No, here we are all about Jesus. And I don't, I I could, I had to do research because I didn't remember the last time we talked about money here. I figured out, it took me about a half an hour, but I finally found the last time we talked about money here at this church was in November of 2015. So three years ago. So we're not obsessed with money here at all. We just preach through books of the Bible. And so we preach on whatever the next passage is. And so you just happen to be here today when we talk about money. So that's the way it goes. And because we teach through books of the Bible, that means that this sermon is not a hobby horse or something that I'm like, we need to talk about this because there's something wrong financially here. There's nothing wrong financially here. We have no debt. Our giving is about 18% over our budgeted need for the year. So we're fine. This message isn't a plea for help. This is not about what I want from you. This, This message is going to be about really what I want for you. You are already a very generous church. I, I can't thank you enough for that. We are three, year, three and a half years old as a church. And really, the, the, one of the main reasons why this church still exists is because of the generosity of the people that call this church home. So like I said, this is a generous church, no doubt. The question is, are you, am I, one of those generous people? See, this message is, is not really about money. It's, it's about the work of the Spirit in our lives. So when God saves someone from their sins, the, the Spirit, the, the third person of the Trinity, he takes up residence, and as soon as he shows up, he starts to change that person from the inside out. His, his goal is to make Jesus look so wonderful to us, so incredible to us, that we actually want our lives to be like his. We like, I don't want to be me anymore. I want to be like him because he is so wonderful. Now that happens as we follow the Spirit's leadership in our lives. He leads us into obedience and holiness and Christ-likeness. He leads us into repentance and change as well. And what will that change look like? Well, we've been seeing this, chapter 5, verse 22. That change will look like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That those are the the virtues that, that the New Testament says, this is who Jesus is. And so the Spirit is conforming us into those fruit But those fruit are simply making us look more like Christ. And what we've been seeing is that those virtues are not for you and me personally. Like, I need to be a more loving person. No, these virtues are meant to be experienced in relationship. Meaning the way we show the Spirit is at work in us is not just through our Bible knowledge or self-discipline or mystical experiences. He is seen in us in how you and I treat each other. Your growth, your maturity as a Christian is pretty easy to determine. Compare how you interact with the people that you interact with most. Compare your interaction with them to those nine fruit of the Spirit, those nine evidences that he's at work in you. If he is at work in you, those around you will be loved. You'll be patient with them. You'll be at peace with them. You'll be kind to them. You'll be faithful to them. You will be gentle with them. And then what he does is he takes this, these general ideas and then he begins to be specific. So in chapter 5, verse 26, he says, When the Spirit is at work in your life, when these fruit are coming out of your life, it will create a community of people who are, who are humble. Notice, 
who are not conceited and provoking one another, challenging one another, uh, causing conflict, and not envying one another. But there's, there's humility there. Then last week we saw when the Spirit is at work in our lives. It shows up in the way that we, 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 we treat people who are in sin, that, that we're gentle with them. It talks about the way that we, we carry one another's burdens, we, we, that, that no one carries a burden by themselves, but we come alongside those who are burdened and we carry, them, and we carry those burdens with them. And then today what we see in these specific examples that he gives to these Galatian churches is he says, well, there's this, there's this other area where, where you're going to see the Spirit's work in your life, where there's going to be tangible, actable, ev- actual evidence. And it starts in verse 6. We're going to see what it looks like to demonstrate Spirit-submitted lives in the area of our finances. See, we've got this, the flesh, we've talked about that too, it's that anti-God, self-centered part of us, that part of us that tries to get us to be dominated by sin and selfishness. That part of us, have you noticed, is activated by money, right? Our money is hard to earn, and so when we get it, our flesh convinces us that this money exists for me, it's my benefit, my pleasure, my needs, But because the Spirit is at war with the flesh, chapter 5, verse 17, the Spirit helps us understand that, that yes, our our money is given to meet our needs and even for our pleasure, no doubt. But it was also given to us to meet the needs of others. Verse 10, especially other Christians who are in need. So to follow the Spirit's leadership in our lives is to be open-handed and generous and even sacrificial with our money. Miserly, stingy, greedy, clutching Christians are a contradiction. Or to be more specific, to summarize this text, it is in your best interest. It is in your best interest both now and into eternity to invest your money, but also your time and your talent, to invest your time, your talent, and your treasure into your local church. Now, if that statement kind of felt uncomfortable for you, just know it was like a thousand times more uncomfortable for me to say right? Because it sounds self-serving. But here's the deal. Here, we preach the word. We're unapologetic about it. And so when it comes to this text, we're going to preach the text. And so let's jump into verse 6 and see what God's word has to say to us about spirit-submitted lives in the area of finances. Verse 6, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Translation, if you're learning and growing because of your church, you should support it financially. This is just one evidence that God's spirit is at work in you. Notice verse 6, this is individual. Notice it says, let each one. So this text is examining all of us individually. Notice too, the issue is not who's doing the teaching or how good are they at teaching or how gifted are they. No, the issue is, notice the text, the issue is the content of the teaching. It's the word, it's the Bible, it's the gospel. So financial support of ministries is determined by how that ministry spreads the word of God. Notice also the instruction, that word share. That word share is a command. And it's a command that's in the present tense, which means this. This is to become our habit in life. It's not supposed to be one-time, erratic, accidental giving. This means regular, planned financial support. And then finally, I want you to think about that word share too, because that's the same word, koinonia, that's used for our relationship with the Holy Spirit. That this is not like paycheck for services rendered. This is a partnership. This is a a mutuality exists here. This, This is where each one shares the good things that they have for the benefit and blessings of other people. Now listen, this is not a message about giving to this church. This is a message about giving to your church. So you, this might not be your church. You might be visiting from another, from another state or another country. You might, this might be your first time, so you're just kicking the tires. You're like, okay, well, what's going on here? So, I, so I'm not telling you that you need to give to this church because this might not be your church. If it is your church, then the application of this text is to give here. But it's beyond that. So let's start in point number one. Whenever you're, wherever your church is, the point is that you demonstrate submission to the Spirit in your finances. In point number one, you invest in your church primarily. Invest in your church primarily. If your church is devoted to the proclamation of God's Word and to training people in God's Word, it should be, must be, supported financially. 
A teacher, a pastor, a ministry proves that it is worthy of our contribution, worthy of our financial support by what that ministry is teaching. So all those who benefited from a ministry spiritually should follow the Spirit's leadership and benefit that ministry financially. God put it this way. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 9, 14. The Lord, what's that word? Commanded. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Now the context of chapter 6, verse 6, is Christians in churches with pastors teaching them the Bible. So now I'm going to meddle for just a second. He's not talking about parachurch ministries, relief organizations, charities, or political parties. Those didn't exist when this command was given, right? What did exist? The local church. Now, all of those things are great, so hear me. All of those things are great. All of those things are used by God in great ways. All of those things should be supported, just not primarily. According to this text, if your local church is teaching the Bible, it should be the first place where, that you support financially. And if you trace this, this idea throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, what you will find is this. Whether it's Levites in the Old Testament or whether it's to faithful pastors in the New Testament, God's people always gave first to his work, then to everything else. And what that did was it showed God saying, look, you, I, need to, I need to put this in your mind because where you give your money shows how important you think that the work of God is. And, and, it, and it's, it's to mean more to us than anything else. And so he's saying it's, it's primary, it's, it's off the top, it's never the leftovers. However, have you noticed how ministries that promote false teaching, that deceive people so badly that they end up in hell, have all the money that they need and then some? You ever notice that? And the same time ministries devoted to God's word are in poverty by comparison, why is that? Why do you think that is? I'm not a prophet. I have no idea why that is. I just know that it is a sad fact of reality. When we give first to the Lord's work through a local church that is, that is teaching his word, we are demonstrating spirit-led lives. And we are indicating how important we think the teaching of God's word is. So in the words of, of Galatians 6.2, when, when we give to the local church, we're, we're also bearing the minister's burdens. So our giving frees them from focusing on caring for, for their needs and the needs of their family. So, so at the same time, it frees them up to focus on studying and preaching God's word. It frees them up to, to pray for and lead and, and pastor and shepherd and care for the people that God's given them. Now, if you're sitting there right now going... All right, well, that's nice, but I don't have two nickels to rub together. You know, it's embarrassing, you know, Pastor, but I, I just can't do what you're saying. Well, let me say this. There, there are ministries out there that would say at this moment, you got a credit card? Put it on your credit card. Give to the church. You should never, ever go in debt giving to a church, okay? So when, when, whenever you hear a ministry tell you to do that, that is the indication right there. Change the channel, Okay? <laughs> Go to a different church, because that is sin. Um, but notice verse 6. Verse 6 says, all good things. Now, most scholars think that's money based on some cross-references, but it doesn't stop there. All good things is broad. It means share the good that you have. So maybe you don't have money to give, but you have time. Invest that. Maybe you don't have money to give, but you have uh, skills or, or a passion. Invest that. And then give when you're able. Ephesians 4.16 tells each Christian, all of us have a part to play in, in advancing the ministry and advancing the gospel through our local churches. And so that includes our time and our talents, but it also includes our treasure. Investing in your Bible teaching church. Again, whether or not that church is here, that's not the point. The point is, is our life demonstrated that we are spirit submitted in our finances? Or God puts it this way. Look at 1 Corinthians 9.11. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? So Paul's thing is, if we've put God's word into your heart, if, we, if we've taken the truth and we've planted it in your soul, is it too much to harvest financial benefits from you? Rhetorical question, answer, no, it's not too much. In fact, we, what we've seen so far is that it's our obligation to give where we're fed and to give there first. 
Now, Paul used this agricultural metaphor there in 1 Corinthians 9, 11. He also uses it starting in verse 7 of Galatians chapter 6. And he uses it to encourage us to do this. Because inside our flesh, there's this, I don't want to do this. Like, this is, this is mine, and I'm supposed to use it for me. And, 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 and so he says, okay, let, let me encourage you to do this now. Take a look at verse 6. And notice just 6, 7, and 8, they just flow right together. The one who is taught in the word, share all good things with the one who teaches. Okay, so there's the instruction. Now here's the motivation. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now this is a universal law in farming, right? You harvest what you plant. You reap what you sow. So you plant corn, and you don't get chickens, right? You plant corn, and you get corn, Brilliant, right? Simple. Well, what Paul is saying is he's taking this agricultural truth, this universal teaching, you, you reap what you sow, and he says this applies in, in, in life. You reap what you sow. In other words, you will experience the consequences of your decisions. So will I. In other words, your present actions are seeds. They're little seeds. And the future consequences of those actions is the harvest, And if you're sitting there right now going, wait a minute, doesn't that contradict grace and the gospel? No. Jesus sowed perfect righteousness, and he reaped eternal life. Instead of hoarding that to himself, what does he do? He shares what he accomplished with all those who would believe in him. So what he he sowed, what he reaped, he shares. True, the Christian, therefore, is never going to reap the full consequences of our sins because Jesus already reaped all of those consequences for us. However, we do still reap the earthly consequences of our sinful behavior, right? We reap what we sow. Well, verse 7 comes right after verse 6. So what he's saying is that this principle of reaping and sowing applies where we invest our money. So to think otherwise, verse 7, would be, de- would be deceived, would be to be led astray from the truth. And then actually, God is not mocked. That, I, that word mock means to turn your nose up. So to say, no, this, this whole reaping and sowing thing, like just that, that's a bunch of nonsense. Just, people use that to manipulate uh, people to give money. God, Paul's like, uh, no, that would be turning your nose up at God who created life to work this way. So verse 6, the instruction. 7 and 8, the motivation. The context is financial support for your church. And the motivation is this. One day, God will bring a harvest of blessing into your life when you share all good things now. That blessing may be during your lifetime. It will certainly be in the coming lifetime. So you demonstrate the submission to the Spirit in your finances. When point number two, you invest in your church generously. Invest in your church generously. Like planting seeds on a farm, the more you plant in general, the bigger the harvest. The less you plant, the smaller the harvest is going to be. In other words, the more you invest in your church, the more your returns will be. Invest a little, expect a little. Invest generously, expect a lot. You're like, what? okay, that just, that just seems too, that just doesn't seem right. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Could not be any clearer. Whoever sows sparingly, whoever does the minimum, whoever gives the minimum, they're just giving a little, what does it say? They will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully, whoever's generous, whoever gives and gives and gives, will also reap bountifully. This is God, Malachi 3.10, saying, give, and you cannot outgive what I'm going to give you in return. Now, I'm hesitating because there are a whole bunch of false teachers on so-called Christian television who say, give me a dollar and God will give you ten back. I mean, if they really believe that, wouldn't they give you all their money? Wouldn't they give you ten dollars? When they give you anything, they don't give you a thing. Why? Because they're scam artists whose end is the lake of fire. But God will give in return to what you give to his work. And because he's generous, what he gives back will probably be exponentially bigger than what we gave down here. And the returns, that reaping, that harvest, verse 7, is so sure that if we didn't get a return on our, our, on our spiritual investments, then God would be a liar and worthy of mockery if we didn't get him. And there's more here in verse 8. 
But this is going to take our giving talk to the next level. Okay, so this, if you're like, so this is the moment you need to like put on your spiritual seatbelt because this, what verse eight says is, is you, you're not thinking this. Verses seven and eight, coming after verse six, God is saying that the investment of your money in a Bible teaching church is one indicator of where you and I will spend eternity. What you do with your money does not earn your salvation. What you do with it is one indicator of who your God is and where you, where you are already headed. In other words, our bank accounts expose where our hearts really are with God. Now, that's not me. Take a look at the text, verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. So to use your money exclusively on you to satisfy your flesh, that anti-God tendency in, in us, to, to maximize it for ourselves, that's one indication that you'll reap eternal corruption. That word corruption is not referring to like, oh, like eventually it'll just all pass away. No, this is talking about eternal uh, decomposition that happens in the lake of fire. This eternal decomposition that does never leads to disappearance. How do I know that? Because look at the parallel at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of verse eight. But the contrast, the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap a good life. Is that what it says? It says what? Eternal life. So you see that we just upped the ante here. This is more than just, hey, give and it'll be given back to you. No, this shows where our hearts really are. To use your money for the eternal good of others, to satisfy God's will, to maximize it through your local church for the, for the glory of God's kingdom, that's one indication that you will reap eternal life. Now listen, no one is saved by their good works. But listen, no one is saved without good works. A life following the Spirit's lead is evidence of saving faith, and that evidence is seen in what we do with our money in relationship to our church. Our lives are compared here to two fields, okay? We've got the flesh field, and we've got the spirit field. In context, what we do with our money plants seeds in each of those fields. The harvest depends on which field we plant in most and how much we plant in that field. See, I'm afraid that most of us, we we don't think about this. We're not thinking about the next life. We're like, I'm just glad I'm saved, and whatever happens after that happens. That's not biblical teaching. Biblical teaching is you prepare for that day today, by how we live our lives, by how we use our time, our talents, and our treasure, we are going to have a better or worse life in the next life. Yeah, we'll be saved. Yeah, we'll be in glory, forgiven of our sins. But the Bible teaches rewards. It, is, it, is, it, it, it does not flinch or blush about rewards. Now, because we don't think about that, we're not ready for it. We won't be ready for it. So this is a neglected teaching, but it's needed. How you live here impacts what your life will be like there. If you plant a few seeds in the garden of the Spirit, your harvest in the next life will be very small. You will have sown sparingly, so you will reap sparingly. How how great your harvest will be depends on how much, verse 7, you used whatever you have. Your money, yes, but your time, your abilities in ways that God wanted to. Now Now let's think about this for a minute. Okay, yeah, Jesus said something about storing treasure in heaven. Do, do you really believe this? Do I really believe this? See, if, if you and I really believed this, we would be the most generous group of people ever. There, wouldn't, there, couldn't, there couldn't possibly be anyone more generous than us if we really believe this. How much you give in this life determines how much you will reap both now and especially in the next life in eternity. We would not use anything for ourselves only. We'd be thinking like, how can I, how can I use this to bless someone else? Like, thank you for this gift. Like, I, I'm gonna use this to bless someone. Like, like we, we would always be thinking like, how could I use this? But we, we don't. We, we, we are trading um, eternal blessings for, for immediate pleasures. We, we, when, when we would, we should use this life for the next. And so what does investing generously look like practically? Christians from every denomination for all, really like all of Christian history have, have looked at giving 10% of your income, not as a law, but as a benchmark. So for every $10 you get, you give $1 to the Lord's work. Now for some of you, 10% each month would bankrupt you. So 
Start with five. Start with one. The percentage doesn't matter. The heart is what matters. What is my God? Is it my checking account or is it Jesus? What matters to me most? What I can do with my money or what the Lord will do with this money? That's the question. And so whether it's 5%, 1%, 10%, commit to investing your money in the Lord's work through through your local church. Wherever your church is, commit today to investing in it generously. For others, 10%, you could do that without feeling that at all. See, if you can give without feeling it, you're probably not giving enough. And this is what it should be if you're thinking, okay, practi- help me practically. Because like, there's all kinds of books and charts and figures and TV shows on, on this stuff. Let me just make it very simple. Give first, save second, live on the rest. Right? That's what it is. Give first, save second, live on the rest. And with that live on the rest, that's where you give even more. To those charities and to those relief organizations. That's where we give it from. It makes me think of this poem by, by a man named C.T. Studd. I don't know about you, but if I could have one last name, it would be that one. <laughs> Studd. Like, what a name. But he really was a stud. He was a missionary, to one of the first missionaries to China. And he wrote this poem, and, and it's, it's this one line of the poem has become famous. You probably heard it. If you haven't, listen. It goes like this. Only one life will soon be passed. You know the rest? Only what's done for Christ will last. Yes, it will last here, but it will also last there. Or Jesus put it a little differently. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Think about it. That is a command. Lay up. That is a command. A, continu- a command in a continuous tense, meaning this should be your habit of life, my habit of life, to store up for our trials. Not, not treasure in our bank accounts, not treasure in our 401ks, but treasure in heaven. All of us, all of us should be hoarders here of treasure in heaven, is what Jesus says. And this is true for our money, and it's actually where the text goes next. Look at Galatians 6, 9. Still in the context of money, God says through Paul, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Doing good is how Paul considers investing our money and being generous with it towards ministry, towards a ministry that's teaching God's word. But notice when we get to the very bottom, it's almost like what starts in the church is supposed to spread to all people. That's what it says to, to do good to everyone, to all people. So that's what I said. Those parachurch and, and those, 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 those charitable organizations, they're great. They do a lot of great work. They help Christians fulfill verse 10. But verses 6 to 10 were written in the context of money. But each has a wider application. So verse 6, again, we saw it's sharing all good things. Verse 7, it's whatever we sow, whether it's money or time or our abilities or whatever. And now, and now in verses 9 and 10, it's doing good. Not just to people everywhere, but notice the end of verse 10, especially to other Christians. And the idea here is this. When it comes to giving, when it comes to serving, when it comes to being involved in people's lives, caring, burdens, meeting needs financially, when it comes to those things, it's going to be taxing on us. It's not going to be easy because it's, it's going to hurt to give our time It's going to, when we don't have a lot of it. It's going to hurt to give our ability. It's going to hurt to give our money. But that's where verses 9 and 10 comes in. What does he say? Don't stop. Don't become discouraged. Don't give up. Keep doing it. But he also says, Why? Do you notice in verses 9 and 10 what the reason is for not growing weary? Because whether in this life or the next, you will see a return on your investment. So keep loving, keep serving, keep giving, keep blessing those around you. you in other words, when you are in heaven, you will never see the love that you express towards other people down here as a waste of time. You'll never see your ministry to others here 
as time wasted when you're in heaven. You'll, you'll never see your giving to the Lord's work here as wasted money when you're in heaven. So the idea that Paul is saying again is let that day impact today. You demonstrate, in other words, the submission to the Spirit in your finances when, point number three, you invest in your church consistently. You invest in your church consistently. Building off this idea of not growing weary, not giving up, we continue, we keep going. We don't give up to do good with our finances by investing them in our church. Again, wherever your church is, whatever church you go to, much giving is done to meet immediate needs to get results, right? So it's not going to be very long before we start to see commercials, we start to see ads on social media for us to give money to what's going on in California and all those wildfires again, right? It happens every single time, and that's fine, that's great. People should do that. But when, when we see that people suffering, uh, we see, so we give, and then we get some letter, we get some, we get some info that tells us, well, here's how your money helped. Here, here are the people that you helped with your money, and that's great. One pastor called that intervention giving. So, so we're, our, our giving is, is intervening to meet a need. This text is challenging us to a totally different kind of giving. The giving being talked about here, as we saw, verse 6, is commanded. And it's in the present tense, which again means it's supposed to be regular and generous. And it's consistent, meaning not giving up when tempted to do so. So when you consistently invest a percentage of your money into a local church that's teaching the Bible, that's not intervention giving, that's prevention giving. Intervention gives to a crisis. Prevention gives to prevent crises from ever happening. What do I mean by that? Well, you can't measure how many marriages will never face a blow-up destruction because those people were taught consistently every Sunday in sub-ministries and growth groups and all of that to honor God and stay faithful and love and give and serve. A church that teaches the Bible prevents that. You can't measure how many children are not going to fall into, uh, into uh, drugs or unwanted pregnancies or reckless behavior because from an early age they were taught in Awana and, and on Sunday mornings to memorize the Bible, live their lives according to God's word, to live knowing God is watching and he's real. The church that teaches the Bible does that. When you think about it, a church that teaches the Bible gives you the discernment that you need. So what happened in the book of Galatians doesn't happen to you. False teachers don't show up in your life through some book or TV show or a friend and it's like, hey, you should believe this. And you are instantly able to go, uh-uh, no, that's not true. You know what the result of that is? The prevention, preventing you from falling into false teaching and heresy comes from a church that teaches you the Bible. Right? I mean, those are just three examples. I'm sure that we could brainstorm a whole bunch of things that will never happen in people's lives because of a local church that teaches the Bible. Now, we'll, Christians will always be in the business of intervening to help those who are hurting. But the power of a local church that's teaching the Bible is in what it prevents. And that can never be measured until, until at least in this life, but God is measuring it. God knows. He's making a list and checking it twice. He knows. And every seed that you plant, every, every good deed that you do, every, every gift that you give is building a harvest for your life someday when you stand before Christ. And it starts here, verse 10. As you have opportunity, but it spreads to everyone, intervening in crises and preventing crises from ever happening. By giving consistently and generously, you're preventing the horror stories that people give millions of dollars to every year from ever being written in hundreds of people's lives. I don't want to think about what I would have done or where I'd be if it weren't for the influence of a local church in my life. I'm sure if we put the microphone up, we could all say the same thing, many of us. If you aren't giving to your church, again, wherever your church is, I want to challenge you to start doing so today, regularly, 
not growing weary, not giving up, but doing it, verse 10, as you have opportunity. You see that in verse 10? So you, you, I, I read that at first and I thought, okay, so when you have an opportunity, whenever that opportunity presents itself, we should meet that need. But that's not what that text is saying. That, that, that idea of as long as you have opportunity really means as long as you're still breathing. The rest of your life. This life, your life as a Christian is for sowing. The next life is for reaping. Really, this whole text is about the next life. I don't know if you noticed it. Why invest your time, your talent, your treasure in your, verse, in your church now? Look at verse 7. Because you, what does it say? Will reap. That's future. Because verse 8, you will from the Spirit reap. Because verse 9, in due time, at the appointed time when you stand before Jesus, like we saw last week, what does it say, verse 9? You will reap. And so verse 10, as we have opportunity, while we're still breathing, use today to get yourself ready for that day when your faith becomes sight and you're rewarded for every single thing you did here in the name of Christ and for his glory. How do we make that day a great day? By doing our part. By generously, consistently investing our time, our talents, our treasure in our local church. In doing that, we, we, we stop merely attending and we start advancing God's work. We get out of the stands and we get into the game. I, I think of, when, when I think about this, I think about the, the end of Schindler's List. Do you remember that if you saw that movie, Schindler's List? You remember the very end? He's surrounded, the war is over. And he's surrounded by over a thousand people, a thousand Jews that he, he protected from the concentration camps. And it was in that moment, the war is over, everybody's free. Do you remember what he started doing? He looked at his watch and he said, oh my, like this could have been another person. He looked at his ring, he said, oh, this, I could have saved somebody else. He looked at his clothes. He looked at his stuff. He said, what was I thinking? Like I could have used all of this and more people could have been saved. And sadly, I think for, for many of us, we're gonna have that moment when we stand before Jesus and we're gonna go, what was I thinking? Why didn't I, why didn't I live down there like that was passing away and this was real? See, there's one thing better than playing on the field. You know what it is? It's getting rewarded for your play on the field, right? You play and then you, you win the award, you stand on the podium and you realize there is a day when you will stand on the podiums of heaven and you will have all of, the, all of these, the, these, this harvest of blessing, harvest of treasures that you were hoarding there and Jesus will take one of them maybe, this crown and he will put it on your head and, you will say, and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you, you a little, and look what you did with it. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's live like that day is really coming for each of us and demonstrate the work of the Spirit in our lives in this very awkward but helpful area of our finances. Let's pray. God, we need prayer for this because this does not come to us naturally. Naturally, we do just the opposite. So God, I pray for your grace for each of us. I ask that you would help us to understand why is it that we're here this morning? What is it that you wanted us to learn? How is it you wanted us to grow? What is it that you wanted to challenge? What is it that you wanted to encourage? I, I don't know those things. I never know these things but I know how you work in my life. And that text was challenging, Lord, for me. I pray that you would help each of us here to live lives that are more submitted to the Spirit, His leading, His direction, His control in this area of our finances. I don't know what huge step, what small step, who knows, that's for you to determine in each of our lives. But show us what that is and give us the grace to respond. In Jesus' name, amen.